We've been in this kingdom culture offsetting a cancel culture in the voice of the way the enemy wants to kind of shut down and shut out the opportunity that we have to be a voice in our communities, to be a voice where God has placed us. And I know that many times when we talk about this, you can think of the imagine, okay, what, what am I supposed to do with this? I understand that preachers are going to preach and people that sing are going to sing, but if I don't do any of those things, how do I make a difference? And I think that one of the things that the enemy has really worked hard to do, not just with the way that he wants us to focus on things that aren't important or to focus on things that consume our energy that really don't make the biggest difference. I think that that's true. But one of the things I see very plainly is the way that the enemy would love to institutionalize the church of Jesus Christ. I was watching a movie years ago. It didn't get great reviews wherever it came out, but there's a part in this movie. I was watching it on TNT or TBS. It's kind of edited out a lot of the language and things like that. But in a part of this movie, it talked about how after you are in a place for a while, it can institutionalize you. And when you become institutionalized, you don't know how to function in the world as everyone else knows it. And I kind of think of that example, and I see how clearly that it works when it comes to what the enemy would love to do to people that have an experience with Jesus Christ. Like, number one, you have to know that the enemy is not excited about the encounter that you had with Jesus Christ. He's never going to be celebratory and say, hey, that's good. I'm glad that you now can be free, that you can live set free, and you can make a difference everywhere that you go. He's not going to celebrate that. And guess what's not going to happen? The enemy's not going to put people in your life that are going to celebrate the godly things that have happened. But I think one of the biggest unspoken things that the enemy does and that he would love to do and continue to do would be to shut the mouth of the church of Jesus Christ and keep them inside the four walls of a building and never preaching the message everywhere that they go. I believe he would love to institutionalize the New Testament church. I believe that as the New Testament church had incredible experiences that God gave them from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, I believe that the enemy would have loved nothing more than for those 120 people to stay in the upper room in Jerusalem and never get outside of that room. He would have loved for them to stay there and have their experience over and over and over and fall out again and brag to each other about how powerful it was and let's keep chasing that feeling and let's just don't ever leave this place. Why? Because whenever you experience something powerful with God, there's a, there's a tendency to say, I want to camp out here forever. But every experience that Jesus Christ gives you isn't to stay locked in that moment. It's to prepare you for all of the moments that God is going to allow you to have in your future. Every single thing that you experience with Jesus Christ, the promises that he has given you is preparing you for the moments that haven't happened yet. But the enemy would have loved for them to stay locked in that upper room and never coming out of that upper room and making a difference everywhere that they went. You and I are a product of people that were common, ordinary, everyday people that surrendered their lives to everything that God had for them and we received the message of hope of it. See, Jesus gave them an example to follow. He refused to let religion, like the Jewish customs and traditions that were there, to allow that religious ideology to keep from his message going forward. They wanted to shut, to shut down the opportunities of, of God's grace and God's mercy going and, and, and reaching the broken and the hurting. He, he wanted to, the enemy wanted to shut that down and he wanted to use people with a, with a, with a nasty heart to do it. But Jesus refused to allow that culture to rob from the mission of what God had for them. And Jesus was as much about the individuals as he was the masses. Jesus didn't push away the masses. As the masses came in, he would use his teachable moments. And from that crowd, he would get his core. And from his core, he had his committed. And from that committed, the church of Jesus Christ goes out. And this produced what we call followers of Jesus, disciples. Followers of Jesus followed his example. 
It's what we talked about on Easter in a third class ticket that Jesus was his hour had come and he knew that there were things that they had missed. They had seen the miracles happen. They had seen the powerful moments that he had, had given them to see. He had allowed them to be used. And they started talking about popularity and where who was going to sit and who was going to have more authority. He says, you, don't, you haven't learned from my example. You haven't, you don't have my heart. Which is why he washed their feet. He wanted them to understand. And from that moment, there were things that were revolutionized. And the example to be followed by disciples of Christ. A disciple of Christ is someone who's going to be accused of the same things that Jesus was accused of. Loving, serving, giving, honoring the Father. Those are the things that are core and paramount in the life of a follower of Jesus. In the book of Acts, chapter 16, you're going to see an example here in Paul and Silas. Now, this is the first moment that you don't see Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas, Barnabas goes his way. Paul goes his way. And now Silas joins him. In Acts chapter 16, we pick up and read together. It says, when her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. So what's happened here is there was a woman who was following them around and, and shouting to the top of her voice, these are servants of the most high God. This is a woman who had a spirit. She had a spirit that she could talk about things or try to predict the future and people would pay her for that. She got on Paul's last nerve always screaming, always making a bunch of noise and because there were things like this that happened throughout the communities of the, where they traveled. There were always people that had spirit and a spirit to them. Not every spirit that someone has is a godly spirit. And they were, she was being used, she was being marketed by these people that basically were her owner. And the gift that was, she was using to distract now goes from just doing her thing to now she wants to distract people from the message that Paul and Silas are preaching. And Paul has had enough of it and he, and he rebukes that spirit, tells the spirit to come out of her. So then what happens? Now this dark spirit that was in operation in her life no longer is producing an income for her owners. It's amazing how the kingdom of darkness doesn't mind people that are, are, are dark or are doing things that aren't godly. They will allow godly people to do whatever they want till it messes with their money. And now that this has happened, they knew that they could cause an issue with saying that they were doing things that were unlawful for them to follow or practice as citizens of Rome. Only problem is, is Paul and Silas are also citizens of Rome but they get punished like they weren't. Verse 22 says that the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. It's crazy to me when I see that the, the crowd doesn't even know what they're supposed to be mad about. Look, we live in a day in a society where we understand this all too well. People will make an argument and will defend things they're not even passionate about. They just want to argue. They just want to jump on a bandwagon and roll with that. This crowd jumped on, and they, were, they probably had the, had the popular thing to do, been to listen to everything Paul and Silas said and follow that. They may have jumped on that bandwagon. But now that they've seen that they were going to be able to have something that's going to be driven by a crowd, they just jump on the, on the bandwagon with it. They order them to be stripped and beaten with rods. It says, after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. And when he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Verse 25, 
about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to take his own life because he thought the prisoners had escaped. Why would he want to take his own life, fall on his own sword? Because in this culture, life was not the paramount. It was not the set up to value. It was you had a job to do, and when you no longer do that job for me, you are useless to me. When you become an inconvenience in my life, you are done. So he knew that if they had escaped, that they were going to kill him because he failed to do what was ordered of him. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. Man, I love that. I love the fact that they could have gone as free men because the walls had fallen and the doors were open and the chains were off. And they said, hey, we're here because the Lord wants us to be here. In the middle of what everybody else thought was a terrible moment, oh, this God's, we stay in. We're here. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas, and he then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your whole household. At the moment that this man prayed to receive Jesus, that he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ that his household immediately, the moment that he prayed, become saved? No, but by the example of the encounter that he had with Jesus, they knew that his household would fall into line with his leadership. Because when you have an experience with Jesus Christ, it will change. It will start in your house. It will start in your house. So I see this example that we read about in Acts chapter 16. I see this example repeated in the lives of his followers. There is boldness, crazy boldness in the face of adversity that you could not shut them down or shut them up. That not even death, when Stephen was martyred in the early chapters of Acts, not even that could shut down the church of Jesus Christ as he was persecuted as he was killed for the gospel's sake, as people were locked in prison, when Peter and John were locked up and were told not to speak of Jesus, they said, we cannot stop talking about Jesus Christ. Could not do it. And they kept on pursuing people that were broken and hurting and going into the marketplace and telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ. Why is it good news? Because it's the only news that gives broken and hurting people a chance at life to be made new. Everything else was about become a better person, do better things, but the gospel of Jesus Christ says, I'll take you as you are, change your life because of the spirit that's going to live in you and you're going to be made new and the old things are going to pass away. They were driven with that message and they could not be shut down or shut up. They were persecuted heavily. And these individuals scattered. They met in homes. They, they scattered. And, and what the enemy meant to destroy the move of the New Testament church only made it stronger. Because the enemy is not all-knowing, is not all-powerful, and doesn't have massive amounts of wisdom. He just has strategies and a mission statement with his life to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He doesn't just want to steal material things from you. He wants to steal your passion. He wants to steal your joy in life. He wants to steal the opportunities that God has for you because he wants to keep you locked in a prison. Maybe with a, with a prison doesn't have walls and chains that everyone else sees, but mentally you have them. The enemy would love to shut down the voice of opportunity for the New Testament church. That's what he does. 
But what the enemy meant for evil, God used for good. It said, oh, you want to shut us down? You want to scatter us out? You're not going to stop us. All you're doing is multiplying us because people that have an encounter with Jesus Christ can't help but tell people about him. You can't help it. So they're making a difference everywhere they go. This is the culture. This is the kingdom culture in which they lived. Jesus was just as much about the individuals as he was the masses. I believe that Jesus wanted to meet the need of a jailer in Philippi where they're locked up. Who are Paul and Silas to say that that prison wasn't just on the assignment of what God had for them? They're locked up in Philippi, which... I believe is why the church at Philippi is so receptive to the message that Paul writes to them, to the letter that, they, that he writes to them because they have seen firsthand his suffering. They have seen firsthand his consistency. They have seen firsthand his drivenness to the mission and the call on his life because Paul wasn't always known as a man who wanted to spread the news of Jesus Christ. Now his life is transitioned and transformed and He's making a difference everywhere he goes, even when they try to lock him and his accomplices up. That's why Paul was able to write things like in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. He said, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. The church in Philippi knew that Paul was the real deal. Paul understood simple things. He understood that that the prison would not define him. You understand that the, most of the letters he wrote anyway was from prison. And he wrote about joy and he, drew, he wrote about peace and he wrote about love and he, and, he, and, he, and he wrote about fulfillment in a place where most people would not think that way. And this culture is created, this mindset is created because of an experience with Jesus Christ. See, life will create a prison for every single one of us with walls and chains that not everyone will be able to see, but we will feel them. We will feel like at times there is no hope. We will feel like at times that things become so heavy that we can't go on. We, there will be things that want to shackle and attach itself to our lives that keep us from the moments that God has for us. And the things that happen in life and decisions out of our control or maybe things that we decided to do that weren't in obedience to God that have caused some issues in our life. Can I tell you that no matter how you get to the prison, the prison can be a moment that is turned around because you experience the power of God in that season and in that instance. Life has a way of doing that. Paul and Silas were beaten with rods and thrown into jail for what? What did they do? They talked to some women there, told them about the good news of Jesus Christ. This woman wouldn't quit screaming at them and he rebuked the spirit in her. Cast the spirit out. It messed with these worldly people's money and they wouldn't have it. Until then, they didn't care. There wasn't much of a notice about them, but they brought them before the magistrates and was going to see them punished, going to see them finished. And every time the enemy thinks it can pull a punch to shut the mouth of what God is doing, the Lord is already a step ahead of where the enemy is. He's already got an answer to the problem. He said, in this moment, in this culture, in this mindset of where they are, they're beaten, they're, they're flogged, they're beaten with rods, thrown into jail for honoring God. And the things that are learned and their approach is, is that God's got us, God had them and God has us in the palm of his hand and what God has hold of can't be ripped out of his hand, no matter what the situation looks like. And the thing that I see so clearly through this in the culture that is created, number one is this, that our life is an example of who we worship. See, hard moments, prison moments, they push us towards what we have the most confidence in. 
When things don't work out and things get tight, whenever those moments happen and we feel shackled and we feel like we're locked up and we don't have a choice and, we, and bad, things are going bad, who we worship really comes out. So if things get tough and things get bad, what is the first thing that's going to happen for me? Am I going to call my friends and be like, hey, is there anything you can do? Am I going to start getting my hands busy to other things and distracted from the destiny that God has because I got to make something happen? See, when life presses in on us, who we worship really comes out. The pressures of life, when shaking your, your life, who you are, who you really are, really truthfully comes out. If you're an angry person and you're trying to do the right thing and you're trying to live with self-control, can I tell you that if you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you will reap eternal life. And as you sow to the spirit, self-control, patience, love, gentleness, kindness, like the fruits of the spirit, it becomes an overflow of who you really are. And so the things that are toxic in your life are replaced now with things that are the fruit of the spirit. So whenever, whenever life is shaking you, whatever's in your life is going to come out whenever things get difficult. It's why so many people, when life doesn't seem to work out as what they deem as fair, will turn their back on God and pursue their own ambitions and say crazy things like, Pastor Johnny, I gave Jesus a shot, but he didn't do what I wanted him to do. Okay. All right, I'm sorry that he didn't serve you. I'm sorry that he doesn't know better than you. I mean, when you really think about it, if God, who spoke something from nothing into existence, set boundaries and parameters to the stars in the sky and the seas and land and formed it and the birds of the air and the creatures of the field, the plants and all of the order and structure. If God could do that, why do we ever think it's impossible for him to show up in a tough moment? When the, when there, when the earth had nothing God was, and God spoke it into existence. And because God is the most powerful force to ever be on the face of this earth, he is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever think or imagine. Who we worship will always come out when the going gets tough. When those moments get difficult, who we worship will come out. It is the example by which we live our life. When the prison moments press us, true colors come out. See, the guard and his whole family were saved because of their example. Because of their example. He didn't say to the guard, hey, before we leave, don't hurt yourself, but before we go, Y'all confiscated any money? Y'all got some, some clothes? Or you got any kind of, got a house or something? You got a place of honor for us? There was no ulterior motive than to glorify Jesus in that moment. That's all there was. Who we worship sets the example. It sets the example in our life. And here's what I know. Life is full of seasons. Not every season is a prison season. There are times that it's a, a shouting season. There are times where everything is great. But all of us have had seasons in our life, either going through it now or have gone through it, that the walls press in and we feel shackled. It happens it's the one thing we don't talk enough about is the preparing of a heart to be able to know that no matter how difficult it gets, Jesus is still in control. It's the thing we have to be reminded of is that in the middle of their prison, Jesus didn't 
throw them out and say, I'm done with you. You shouldn't have got caught. Should have ran faster. He didn't give them an excuse. He met them where they were in the moment of where they were locked up. And that guard and his whole family were saved because of their example. His whole family got baptized, y'all. It wasn't just, oh, we, we believe that the Lord is good. We believe that this Jesus can do great things. It was this Jesus is the one we want to give everything we are and everything we're not to. And say, here I am. Here's my life. How can you worship? How can you worship in a moment like that? How can they be singing? How can they be praying and singing spiritual songs in prison, locked up? It's because I believe that the kingdom culture and a mindset that we are called to live with is not only that we just worship God and show the example but it's also that we never lose the awe of God in our life. It's this opportunity to understand that we don't let the moment define us, that we define the moment, that we can't choose what's happening all the time, but what we can choose is our response. I'm pretty sure Paul didn't, didn't pray, Lord, let me go to Philippi with Silas on his first missionary trip and let us get locked up in prison. That's what we'd love to ha see happen. But I can tell you what he knew. No matter what was going to happen, Jesus was with them. And no matter where they ended up, he was going to make a way when there seemed there was no way. There was this all, this worship, this approach of an attitude that couldn't be stifled. It was an awe. It's, and awe just simply defined means to be overcome, overwhelmed, or overflowing with gratitude. That when life presses on us, we're just reminded, this is not all there is. There's more to the story. God, I don't understand it. I don't get it. But these shackles... They don't bind me. These walls, this cell, they don't define me. I am in awe in the middle of this prison of how good you are to me. That's the difference between praise and worship. See, praise we learn on the mountaintops in seasons of life. When things are going great and the abundance is there, we praise God for what he's doing. We praise God for his provision. We praise God for our house. We praise God for our cars. We praise God for our shoes. We praise God for the baby's new shoes. But worship's a little different than praise. Praise is thanking God for what he's done. Worship is loving him for who he is. Worship says, if I don't have a house, you're still God. If I don't have a car, you're still good. If you don't show up and do another thing for me, you are God alone and I'm going to worship you. Worship is loving him for who he is. Who is he? He is a protector. He is a provider. He's the Jehovah of the Old Testament and he is the sacrificial lamb of the New Testament that redeems and restores y'all. And it is an awe-stricken thing in our lives to say, God, you've been so good to me that I can't choose. I don't want to choose any other option than just to be struck with awe with you. See, when you have that awe of worship in your life, I can tell you that it will recalibrate your spirit. It's the difference. So I'm to ask us this question today. When's the last time you were stunned and shaken by the presence of God? Do you know that as much as I love singing worship songs in church and we were singing today, my heart is yours and I don't want anything else. We're singing about his love for us, and the power of his name and how beautiful his name is. And I 100% and I agree with all of that. 
And I have been a part of church services where the worship and the presence of God was so tangible that it was thick like a fog. But can I tell you that your greatest worship moments were never intended to be in a building. Your greatest worship moments are in those quiet, still places of your life where you don't have the encouragement of a band and you don't have the encouragement of a vocalist and you don't have the encouragement of everybody singing the same tune as you around you. But when you in that quiet, still moment can sing, God, I don't get it, but I love you and you are good. You are good regardless of what I feel, regardless of what I see. Today, Lord, I choose to worship you. I choose to worship you. I choose to worship you today. I choose to worship you in this moment. I choose to worship you if tomorrow comes or if next week happens. Lord, I choose to worship you. And you say, oh, you get a choice in this? You better believe it because if it wasn't a choice, it wouldn't be worship. I'm choosing to worship. Years ago, I was watching a special and I don't watch enough news, but I watch, I watch a lot of Sports Center. I can't tell you what's everything that's going on in the world, but I can tell you who gets, who's looking to get drafted. So I'm kidding. I do watch the news too, so just pray for me. I'm, it's supposed to be a joke. Some of you are struggling right now. Like, what? But I was watching, it was, it was college game day. I was getting ready for the games. And, you know, somebody, some, you know, if you're a sports fan, you understand this. It doesn't just have to be your team to watch a good game. You just love good games. So I'm watching college game day, and they're giving a spiel, and, and, and they're talking about Clemson. Now, I know that probably no one likes Clemson here, including myself. I get it. But the kingdom's bigger than our teams. And whether you like the team or not, I think that coach does a good job of giving glory where it belongs. And I don't follow him personally to know everything about his life or try to find any skeletons. But from what I understand, he's a pretty respectable guy. So, but if he is, it's the Jesus in him. I get that. But he has an equipment manager that has Down syndrome. And this equipment manager has been with him, and, he, and he's helping, he's serving the team. The team's taking him. like family. It's such a beautiful thing. And he's talking in an example, and he says, Coach Sweeney, says that the only handicap in life is a poor attitude. And it stuck with me. From the moment I heard it, it's just so much of a kingdom truth that our worship, we can't choose everything that happens in life, but what we can choose is our response. We can't choose when the prison comes. We can't choose why the prison comes. We can't choose why dark things happen. We can't, we don't know, we may know, we know it's the enemy, but we don't understand it in every detail every time. But what we can choose is our response. We don't understand why diagnosis has happened the way they do. We don't understand why people get sick. We don't understand why people go through hard times. We, we, we don't have to understand. When it doesn't make sense, here's what we can know. That I'm not going to lose the awe of who God is. I'm going to worship him no matter what. When's the last time you were stunned and shaken by the presence of God? Sprite had a commercial years ago. It says, image is nothing. Obey your thirst. Can I tell you that when you obey the thirst that you have for God, that all, your image will be transformed. And so many times in this life, we worry about the way that people see us instead of living a way that positions us of God, how do you see us? In a time where we are driven by so many things that can distract us, when we are pushed from every angle in the rat race of life, can I tell you, if you are thirsty for the things of God, if you are thirsty for the presence of God, if you are hungry for a move of God in your life, if you have this all of who he is, I promise you, he will meet you in the middle of whatever moment is happening and he will be more than enough for each and every one of us. So I see that Paul and Silas could have as well written about, shared about. Look what we're doing for the gospel. Look how we're laying everything down. Man, we're so great. 
we've gone through more than Simon Peter and James. I mean, they're, they're in the comforts of their cities, and we're out here getting flogged and beaten with rods, and we really love Jesus. Look, it's typical. When you look at biblical examples, it's typical for us and our humanity to think that whenever we're in these moments of suffering and we're loving Jesus through the middle of it, that we're something special. And I will agree that we are something special because of what Jesus has paid for, that we are his workmanship, that we are beautiful because of his hand and his touch on our life. But it's never meant to be something that is arrogant. I love the repetitive theme that I see with the Apostle Paul's life in this culture that is created. And it simply says this, this prison, this beating, being shipwrecked, guess what? This is no sacrifice. This is no sacrifice because the greatest sacrifice has already been given. And now I just get to go through the moments being obedient. So many times in life, we wanna make a sacrifice instead of being a sacrifice. It's why Paul wrote to the church in Rome, I appeal to you therefore, brethren, I beg of you in the view of all of the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideals and its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. This culture, this mindset, this this approach, it really is no sacrifice. It's a benefit. So we just need to bring God everything we are and everything we are not and let him make a holy experiment out of us for this world to see. God is not asking For the believer to dedicate his gifts, abilities, money, time, and ideas, creativity, or any such thing. He is asking the believer to sacrifice himself or or herself for his cause. Oswald Chambers says it this way. We have the idea that we can dedicate our gifts to God. However, you cannot dedicate what is not yours. There is actually only one thing you can dedicate to God, and that is the right to yourself. Do you understand the things that God has gifted you in are not yours. They're gifts God gave you. That's why God's not asking for your gifts. He gave them to you to do his good pleasure. What he's asking for is your life. He's asking for your life. He's asking for everything you are because prison is coming for somebody. Now you think, oh no, I got a, I got a call from a number I didn't know last week. And I've been scared to call him back. You may not be physically locked up, and I hope that you never are. But I can tell you that if times get bad and times get rough, and you preach the truth of Jesus Christ in a society that will not accept it, and they call you hateful, they call you bigoted, and they call, and all you've done is love people. You're not picking at anything. You are just loving people and preaching truth and living truth. And you get ostracized and you get thrown out and you get locked up. Guess what's going to happen? God's going to be with you right in the middle of that moment. This is no sacrifice. I don't understand the approach that says, man, if I give my life to Jesus, he can do a lot of things with me. With what? The gifts he's already given you? No, you will either waste your gifts and talents on this world that will never reward you eternally or you can give your life to Jesus and watch him use the gifts and the abilities that he's given you. 
So many of our teenagers, so many of our young adults get distracted because they're gifted. And we have told them how gifted and awesome that they are. And this world will make an idol out of their gifts and teach them to to pursue and honor and love and value their gifts more over their character. That's why we're not dedicating gifts and abilities and it's all God's. So we give it to him. The kingdom mindset, worship is the difference. As I close today, I want you to understand worship is the difference. Worship is the difference. I encourage you to take a moment this week. If it's not something you normally do, you're like, Pastor, I I can't really sing. It's okay. Find a worship song that really touches your heart and play that and agree with it. Sing with it with the radio up loud so you don't have to hear yourself. Your voice may be so bad you distract yourself from worship. They're singing about death could not hold him and the grave going before silence. You be singing all of that stuff and they're singing it beautifully up here, but you know when you go to sing it, it's going to be like, it's going to come out different. Can I tell you that if that's all you got, God is honored by it because it was never supposed to, because it's all beautiful to him when you sing it for the right reason. Man, have we missed it in this culture. We made worship an entertainment industry. It was never called to be an entertainment industry. It was called to be a lifestyle. Worship is the difference in a mindset and the culture that is created. That is the difference that happened in Paul and Silas' life that these other people in prison sat around and listened to. They were on the inner chamber, shackled and locked up, and the earthquake happened. The doors flew open. The walls fell. And this jailer's family got saved because they were obedient even in their tough moments because they worshiped in the middle of it. They didn't say, man, if we could just get word to Simon Peter, if we could just get word to James, if we could just get word to the other disciples, they'd come running if they knew the bad that was happening. They said, no, we're going to sing and worship God. Worship's the difference. So let's keep it simple. Let's keep it simple. Jesus is what makes the difference. Let's keep it simple. My first response isn't going to be to respond to the situation. It's going to be to worship God and everything. God, I'm just going to worship you right now because you're going to fix my mind. You're going to help me see things, right? I'm just going to worship you. God, you're bigger than this distract. God, you're... if you start there and you keep it simple, it'll keep you from making it complex and stupid and blowing up. So I want to encourage us today as we stand together, if you're able, all across this room, As you're watching online, I just want you to get to a moment where we have the opportunity to just simply get back to the basics. If Jesus has saved you, why did he save you? If God gives you purpose, then what is your purpose? And if you're not going to know and you're not going to live that way, then what are the options? I believe that as worship becomes the priority of our life, not just songs, but that that moment where it's, God, I love you. God, I love you. I I don't understand, but I'm choosing to worship you now. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't have the answers. And people are looking to me for answers. And all I can tell them is to look up from where their help comes from. I worship you. I worship you. I consider myself to be a student. I'm a learner. I'm a reader. This process in life, it never stops of the moving forward and the learning and and learning how to, to make a difference and all those things. But I can promise you that for as much as I want to be a leader, I know that leadership can only flow out of a worship life, at a life that worships God. So before I read a book to try to help, before I gain insight from a coach or a mentor, here's what I can do. I can worship first the living God. 
and say, God, you're the most creative force to ever hit the face of this earth. You spoke something from nothing and put it in the middle of somewhere and made it stay. Lord, you, you used ravens to drop some food off. Lord, your word says you own the cattle in a thousand hills. And today I'm not going to get freaked out by my circumstance. I'm going to worship the God who's in control of everything. And it's going to change the way I view it. It starts in our heart and our lives. And I don't know if I'm doing it justice today for us to understand and gain everything that we have. But I hope that you hear your pastor's heart today so that you understand that God created us and he gifted us for the ability to give our lives fully to him and worship him in every single moment. Because not every moment that happened for the New Testament church was a prison moment. But if they didn't establish the priority of worship, it would have never lasted until this day. Worship is the fundamental truth in our life that defines everything about us.